Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Iowa. It's great being here because the Iowa State Fair, the Iowa De Des Moines Register Soapbox is an incubator of ideas, thoughts, policies, and that goes way, way back. And it continues to be that no matter what happens with the Democratic primary this year. So I know that I'm speaking into an important listening. And what I want to say to you today is that I think it's time for America to turn the page. I think it's time for America to begin again. I think it's time for you and me and all of us, every generation in America today, to steward this country through what is indisputably an important, a significant, and a critical era of our history. One era is passing away. One world is dying. It is crumbling in front of our eyes. And at the same time, another world is struggling to be born. The possibilities are enormous. We have everything we need in this country. We have the people and the best practices and the projects. People who know how to do organic and regenerative farming, who know how to reclaim the earth, who know how to reclaim our, our food, who know how to reclaim our land, who know how to reclaim the energy for that which is healthy, who know how to reclaim our bodies, who know how to repair us after the ravages of 50 years of corporate dominance. A corporate dominance in which the very thought that short-term corporate profits should take precedence over our safety, our health, and our well-being. That those economic ideas, soulless as they are, should take precedence over the will of the people to the point that in the last 50 years, there has been a transfer of wealth to the tune of $50 trillion. And it has ravaged American middle class. In the 1970s, the average American worker could afford a home and could afford a house and could afford a yearly vacation and could afford a, home, a car and could afford one parent to stay home and could afford to send their kids to college. But as soon as they started with this trickle-down economic paradigm, and as soon as Citizens United Corp uh, Supreme Court decision gave those corporate interests the power to basically buy and sell and turn Washington into a system of legalized bribery, all that money was transferred into the hands of 1% of Americans. At this point, that level of economic injustice has ravaged us. It has ravaged our middle class. It has ravaged our environment. It has put carcinogens in our food, toxins in our air. We don't have universal health care like every other advanced democracy does because of the insurance companies. Over a million people in the United States ration their insulin. You don't have that in any other advanced democracy because they have universal health care. But all that because of the greed of the pharmaceutical companies. Look what has happened to Iowa because of the greed of big agriculture and big food companies and big banks. I don't need to tell you, there is no state in this country that is not experiencing the ravages of an old way of doing things and the possibilities of something new. But if we are going to have something new, it's not going to happen because we keep electing those from the old. The idea that the only people qualified to drive us out of this ditch are people who know how to maintain and perpetuate the system that drove us into this ditch is increasingly absurd. My qualifications are not that I've spent years learning how to maintain and perpetuate that system. My qualification is that I know a few things about how to disrupt an unjust system. And that is what we need. We need the American people, particularly the Democrats among us, to become independent enough thinking that we are not just living with this codependent acquiescence to whatever the DNC says. We must remember what George Washington said about political parties, that they could tempt us to become more loyal to our faction than to our country. It is time for us to begin again. The alleviation of stress is not enough. We need fundamental economic reform. We need the things that are actually considered moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. We need universal health care. They'll tell you we don't have it because it's complicated. I'm telling you, we don't have it because it's corrupt. We, we need, we need tuition-free college and tech schools, which they have in every other advanced democracy and which we had until the 1970s. We need to cancel those college loan debts. Why? Because they should never have existed to begin with. 
We need, we need childcare like in every other advanced democracy. We need paid family leave like in every other advanced democracy. We need guaranteed housing like in every other advanced democracy. We need a guaranteed living wage in every, like in every other advanced democracy. One third of America's workers live on less than $15 an hour, and half of them cannot afford a place to live. A living wage in most major cities in the United States is over $20 an hour. Half of our seniors live on less than $25,000 $25, a year. But you and I have been trained to accept too little. We have been trained to limit our political imagination. We have been trained to just go along with the system as it is and to not even consider that there might be another way of doing things. And for those of us who are Democrats, we are told, you must, must not consider another way of doing things. Don't you understand? It has to be Biden. Don't don't you understand? The fascists are at the door. And I want to say to any Democrat who is listening to that, I am here today because the fascists are at the door. I agree with Franklin Roosevelt, who said that we would not have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country, he said, as long as democracy delivers on its promises. Democracy is not today delivering on its promises. Bidenomics is a message that is viscerally contradictory to the experience of the majority of Americans. If you are living within 20% of earners in the United States, yes, the economy is doing well. But that 20% are living on an island surrounded by a vast sea of economic despair. 70% of Americans now say that they live with chronic economic stress. And when the system tells you that it's a mental health crisis, let's be very clear how much of that mental health crisis is rooted in the crisis of economic injustice. And so it is a time of great awakening among the American people. It is a time for a president who is not part of that system. It is time for a president who can, for whom they cannot do anything. It is time for a president who, although I would receive vehement opposition to everything I've told you today, just as Franklin Roosevelt did, from the same people that he received them from, which he called the economic royalists, I would say to those people what Franklin Roosevelt did, I welcome their hatred. And let me tell you something else that I would do. I would go in there knowing it was just for one term, because I would govern in a way you wouldn't possibly do if you were even thinking about running again. We are a country that is like a ship on the way to the iceberg. That iceberg that the Titanic is going towards could take many forms. It could take the form of a weather catastrophe. It could take the form of a eye catastrophe. It could take the form of a nuclear catastrophe. We have to turn this ship around. In my opinion, the Republicans are not turning it around. The corporatist Democrats are not turning it around enough. What those positions will do will mean that we will hit the iceberg a little bit later and at a different angle. We need to turn this ship around. We need to declare a climate emergency. We need to make a just transition from a, from a dirty economy to a clean economy. Everywhere I go, I ask, and I'm going to ask right now, and if your answer is yes, I want you to please raise your hands, and I want you to keep your hands up so everybody can see it. If you are a young person, or you have ever heard a young person say the following words, please raise your hand. Under normal circumstances, I would be thinking of having a child. But given the state of the environment, I don't think it would be a responsible thing to do. Please raise your hand if you or someone you know has said those words. And I would like you to please look around and see all the hands that are raised. This is not normal. And so young people particularly, for whom this is their future we're talking about, why are people who are only going to be here at max another 20 years making environmental and every other policy for people who will only be beginning to hit their stride in 20 years? At this point, even though there are some healthy green investments in the in, um, Inflation Reduction Act, those investments are completely nullified by the fact that the president has approved the Willow Project and has given more 
uh, has given more oil drilling permits than even Trump did. As a Democrat, I'm not worried that of, of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's doing his thing. God bless you. I'm not worried about people voting for Donald Trump in 2024. What to, the danger is to the Democrats in 2024 is how many people might stay home. And the people who might stay home are the people who realize that, yes, we understand the other, the other guys aren't even offering us crumbs, but we can't live on cookies either. And so, as I said to you, we are living at a time of two phenomena. One is a world that is dying in front of our eyes, and another is a world that is struggling to be born. We have everything we need in this country to begin again. We have the problem solvers. The problem is that those with power don't really want to listen to the problem solvers. They're very performative. They'll have them to a reception. They'll have them sitting next to the first lady at a State of the Union address, but they don't really want to invite the problem solvers into the room of power because too often and the problem solver solution does not serve the short-term profit maximization of huge corporate entities that have basically bought and sold the government. So we've got the problem solvers who don't have the power, and we've got those with power who too often are not really listening to the problem solvers. When I think in my mind of what a Williamson administration would look like, this is the image I get. I open the doors of the Oval Office and I say to the problem solvers, come on in, we got it for four years. Because this is time, it's the problem I have traveled around this country. I traveled around this country running for office before, and this is what I believe with all my heart. The American people are not the problem. That's not the problem. The, uh, the majority of Americans, both Republican and Democrats, want universal health care. The majority of Americans, both Republican and Democrat, want tuition-free college and tech school. The majority of Americans, both Republican and Democrat, as a matter of fact, even gun owners, want more common sense gun safety laws. The problem is not the American people. We're fine, thank you. The problem is a system in Washington that does more because of the undue influence of corporate and billionaire money in Washington. That system does more to thwart than to facilitate the actual expression of American democracy. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute about what our ancestors did. We have had tough times before, and in a very real way, everything we're going through now is just the latest iteration of the same old thing. In 1776, 56 men very bravely signed the Declaration of Independence. And I say they were brave because if the British had won the war, they would have been tried and executed as traitors against the King of England. With the signing of the Declaration of Independence, they ensconced, they imbued the founding of a nation for the first time in history with the most radically enlightened principles of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, of the equality of all people, the very notion that all people should have a chance to thrive, all people should have a chance to spread their wings, all people should have a chance to self-actualize, and, and the government is only instituted to secure those rights, and if the government is not doing its job, it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. But that is also where it got very gnarly, because 41 of those 56 men were slave owners. In other words, that is the American story. We have always been both and. We have always been just as we are in this generation. People whose hearts are ablaze with the possibilities of a country in which anyone, if they work hard, should be able to spread their wings and soar versus those who for their own economic and or ideological purposes had no intention whatsoever of allowing that to happen. But if you look at the trajectory of American people, when it is term, in terms of our history, we responded to slavery with abolition. And we responded to the sup uh, institutional suppression of women with the, with the 19th Amendment and the women's suffragist movement. We responded to the overreach of capital in the Gilded Age, the first Gilded Age, with the establishment of organized labor. And we responded to segregation in the American South with the civil rights movement. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, it's our turn now. 
This is the same old story. It is the reiteration of the same old story. And as important as it is that we recognize the problems in our past, it is important that we identify them, but let's identify with the problem solvers. Let's re recognize that surely of course the abolitionists had desperate days, and of course the women suffragists had desperate days, and of course the civil rights workers had desperate days, and of course the early labor organizers had desperate days. To be honest, we need to toughen up. We need to rise up. We need to stand not just against the institutional resistance to the full flowering of American democracy and justice in our time, I think we also have to take a stand against our own cynicism, against our own complacency, against our own laziness, against our own, oh, I'm so traumatized, give me a break. You think the people who walked across the bridge at Selma weren't traumatized? We all have to rise up to no longer be numb, to know that we do have power, but we have a short window, and we need to rush in there now. Now, do I think that I'm the greatest visionary running uh, in, in America? No, I don't think I'm the greatest visionary running in, Ameri uh, uh, in America, but I think I'm the only visionary running for the Democratic nomination for president. And the reason that matters is because, as, as uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, the most important job of the presidency is not administrative. The most important job of the presidency is moral leadership. We don't just need political technocrats, we need visionaries, political visionaries. We don't just need political car mechanics, we, we need to recognize the problem is not that we lack political car mechanics, the problem is that America is on the wrong road. People in Washington live within an energetically walled city. Too often they are emotionally buffered somehow from the despair, the despair, the pain, the chronic anxiety of the American people. I am not. They think in terms of data. I think in terms of despair. They think in terms of what's already happening. I think in terms of that which could be. They think in terms of how to make an unjust system easier for people to survive. I think in terms of ending the injustice. And I believe that it's time for our generation to do that. It's time for our generation to begin again. It's time for us to no longer allow ourselves to simply fall in line, stand in line, and acquiesce to a system for no other reason than that it is backed by so much gargantuan power and money. We need to claim within ourselves the same fierce power that the abolitionists had and the women suffragists had and the early labor organizers had and the civil rights workers had. And we need to say to a system that has hurt Americans before, you did it to my grandparents, you're not going to do it to my kids. Franklin, uh, Abraham Lincoln said at Gettysburg that the men who died there he said that the men who had died for the Union at Gettysburg had given their last full measure of devotion so that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. Our problem is that it's perishing now. We are not now functioning as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We are, we are functioning as a government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. Everybody knows this. I'm not saying anything here today that we don't already know. The issue is what are we going to do about it? Some people say, but Marianne, it's all locked up. I understand. Nobody knows more than I do how that system gets locked up. Uh, nobody knows more than somebody living the experience how they lock you out if they don't want you part of the conversation. But I can also tell you there is one thing that can override that, and that is we, the people, at the ballot box. I know that people are numb. I know that people are kind of beaten down. That is how the system operates to make sure. We need to reclaim the rambunctiousness of the American spirit. We need to stand up in our time. Too many men in our age have been acting like little boys and too many women have been acting like little girls. I think it's a time for a rising up and to remember the words of, of Winston Churchill when he said that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing as, and, as long once they have exhausted every other option. This is how I see it. We are sometimes slow to get there, but when we do get there, we slam it like nobody's business. I'm Marianne Williamson. I'm running for president. It's time for us to slam it like nobody's business.
Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.